Good morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Great. Welcome to church. So good to see you all here. If it's your first time, a warm welcome indeed. We normally um, meet up afterwards and have morning tea together, so it'll be great for us to get to know you. Uh, what an intro. Uh, hotcakes. Thank, thanks, Josh. <laughs> I suspect he's probably said that because uh, we went to Pancakes on the Rocks together, and we, we both enjoy hotcakes together. <laughs> That's all right. All right, yes, yeah, so my name's Jimmy, for those of you who don't know me, and um, I've been coming for, for a long time, and this is my uh, yeah, fourth time uh, being a, a lay preacher, um, and it's a great joy to be able to uh, bring the Word of God to you all, uh, so that we can actually learn from this amazing uh, part of the Bible. Uh, it was in 1996, uh, the first year of my uni degree. Uh, I was very busy studying at the UNSW library, uh, desperately trying to cram in uh, all this information uh, into this brain of mine, as my exams were actually around the corner. Uh, and in 1996, unlike today, the UNSW library wasn't that glamorous at all. It was dark, dusty, it was poorly ventilated, and to put it nicely, it wasn't a very fragrant environment. Um, thank God for all the overseas students who've injected all this money you know, into our universities. <laughs> so the environment wasn't conducive to study at all. And plus, I'll be honest with you all, my mind was elsewhere. I was always off with the fairies. I was always thinking about and ruminating about my girlfriend. <laughs> I couldn't bear studying upper limb, anatomy, lower limb anatomy, visceral anatomy, neuroanatomy. You get the hint, right? <laughs> That's right? I just wanted to see what my girlfriend was doing at that point in time. I was keen to see what, what she was up to. I wanted to write an email. So I left my books on my desk scurried towards the internet room, and I distinctly remember this, this internet room. It's in the kind of middle of the library. Um, the walls are made of, of glass, so you know, everyone can actually see you and watch your you know, um, email at that point in time. Uh, the four really big desktop computers. Uh, there are these really big monitors, a cube-shaped, size of like a, a medium-sized uh, uh, microwave, and obviously very archaic uh, for today's standards. And furthermore, there was always these lines, so you, you had to line up in order to use the, the internet room. And often, you know, it would take 20, 30 minutes uh, to actually get in. Uh, after patiently awaiting my turn, uh, I finally made it into the internet room and made it onto a desktop. Alas, the next challenge now is to actually log on. So back in my day, it was actually dial-up internet connection, right? So, so people, some people are smiling on their heads. Uh, so basically, it was a phone line that actually connected you up for a modem to the internet. And this process would take five to 10 minutes to log on, lo and behold, just onto Hotmail. So there's no, you got bucklers of any streaming, there's no streaming services or anything like that. Five to 10 minutes to log on to Hotmail. And like, literally, it felt like an eternity just to set up on Hotmail. And thankfully, as my years in uni progressed, the internet download speed also progressed significantly. You, you may recall ADSL was rolled out in 99, 1999 and download speeds were about 100 times faster than the good old dial-up. And then it was ADS-2 in 2002. In 2008, the advent of the iPhone, so the iPhone was actually launched. 2009, Androids, a bit of competition for the iPhones, were launched. And both smartphones actually gave Australians uh, the ability to be able to connect to the web swiftly at a touch of a button. In 2019, Australia's first 5G network was launched. And in 2022, the CEO of MBN aimed for its rollout of data network technology broadband to be about 90% complete in 2022. I'm sure many of you have um, you know, experienced the fruits of the, uh, the fibres going into your home. And what a striking contrast, isn't it? From the humble days of extremely slow dial-up internet in 96, which I used to access my hotmail, to email my girlfriend, when I can study, to me now having 5G on my iPhone 13 mini and be able to browse the web at lightning speed and WhatsApp my then girlfriend, now wife, until my heart is content. <laughs> Shrog is really annoyed, actually. <laughs> uh, and I also enjoy the fruits of MBN and have been accustomed to really fast internet speed for my various devices. How could I possibly go back to dial-up internet when the broadband technology is far superior. The old technology is a shadow of the current reality 
of new and superior technology. The old technology is obsolete. The new technology works. Let me open a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, which is so deep and rich. Moreover, your word is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. We are grateful that your word is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Grant us resolve as we will learn about Jesus, our high priest. Give us hearts willing to be obedient. Give us ears willing to hear your message so that we can be moulded by its instructions and encouragement. Pray all these things in your precious son's name. Amen. All right, can I have slide one, please? Okay, so we're looking at, uh, as we know, uh, Hebrews 4.14 to 5, verse 10. And this is the uh, sermon outline. The three major points. Uh, Day of Atonement, a shadow of the reality to come. Uh, Jesus, our high priest. So we're going to spend a bit of time looking at Jesus, our high priest, uh, and what the different characteristics of Jesus, our high priest. And it's really important for us to understand the Day of Atonement, because by understanding the Day of Atonement, it allows us to understand uh, the role of Jesus as our high priest and that what Jesus does is sufficient for our salvation. All right, let's have a look at a hypothetical so we can better understand what atonement means. So if Josh Wong purposely scratches my car because I've parked in his usual church parking spot, Josh has done wrong. Josh has sinned against me. Understandably, I would be upset and angry with Josh. So how do, we, how do we restore that broken relationship? How do we atone for that broken relationship? Well, a payment needs to be made for the consequences of Josh's actions. At the very least, Josh needs to pay for the damages inflicted onto my car. And then secondly, for the atonement to, to take place and for the atonement to occur, I need to forgive Josh's actions towards me. Now, let's have a look at Leviticus chapter 6, uh, verse 29 to 31. So I'll, I'll read that out, and this will set the background for the Day of Atonement. This is to be a lasting ordinance for you, verse 29. On the tenth day of the seventh month, you must deny yourselves and not do any work, whether native-born or a foreigner residing among you, because on this day, atonement will be made for you to cleanse you, it is a day of Sabbath rest, and you must deny yourselves. It is a lasting ordinance. So put simply, on the Day of Atonement, God forgives the sin of the Israelites. That is, God forgives the Israelites' disobedience and rebellion against him. On the Day of Atonement, there is also restoration of the relationship between the Israelites and God. So essentially what happens on the Day of Atonement it's actually based on the instructions given by God to Moses in Leviticus 16 that we just read. So the high priest had to sacrifice for himself first. So it was actually um, bulls that were used to sacrifice for himself first, to atone for his sins first and foremost. And then two goats were actually chosen for the Day of Atonement ritual. So I was actually looking online to buy fluffy toys, um, to fluffy goats, uh, but they were going to charge me $50 per goat, so that would have been $100 to give this uh, sermon illustration. And, and I thought, geez, you know, with uh, the multiple you know, interest rate rises, it's just not a good investment. Uh, so what I've done is I've actually brought um, some, some little fluffy dolls instead. So th these are Street Fighter figures, and you're probably wondering why a 45-year-old would have Street Fighter figures. Um, they're, they're actually my kids, all right? They're, they're not mine. They're my kids. <laughs> okay. But I want you to, yeah, so don't, don't be, you know, don't be distracted. This is not Ken. This is not Zangief, Okay. These are actually goats. These are goats. Okay. All right. So two goats were chosen um, for the Day of Atonement ritual. Uh, one goat was actually chosen to be sacrificed, and the other goat was actually chosen to be a scapegoat. Okay. So goat one gets sacrificed, and the blood of goat one actually atones for the sins of the Israelites. Then there's goat two. So goat two is actually a scapegoat. So the high priest would basically transfer the sins, the Israelite sins, onto goat two, the scapegoat, and then another member 
uh, within the, the priesthood would allow the, the scapegoat then to uh, run out into the wilderness. So that was a, essentially a sign that the community of sins were dealt with. So goat one, the blood actually atones for the Israelite sins. And goat two, uh, goat two is a scapegoat. So symbolically, the sins have been removed uh, and uh, the community of sins uh, are now in the wilderness and gotten rid of. We learn from Leviticus uh, chapter 16 that, once again, atonement is, is a process by which the relationship is restored between God and his people. That is, in the Old Testament, the ritual of the Day of Atonement was designed to cleanse the Israelites of their sins and to restore the relationship with God. However, and this is you know, one of the most important parts of the sermon, the sacrifices were only a temporary covering for sin. They did not take away sin permanently the Day of Atonement actually needed to be performed on a yearly basis. So this would happen on a yearly basis in order for the sins to be atoned for, in order for restoration of the relationship between the Israelites and God. Let's now move to the New Testament. In the New Testament, atonement is used to describe the work of Christ on the cross, which made it possible for people to be reconciled to God once for all. That is, Jesus' ultimate sacrifice was different in that it was a once-for-all sacrifice that took away sin permanently. Jesus' death on the cross was the ultimate sacrifice for sin. So in conclusion, the Old Testament Day of Atonement ritual that was set up for the forgiveness of Israel's, Israel's sins was limited and deficient as it lacked permanence. It was a shadow of the reality to come. Okay, let me read from uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but was made alive in the spirit. We can thus declare Jesus as our great high priest. And how amazing and awesome is that? And now we'll spend some time um, illuminating the characteristics of Jesus as our high priest. Uh, so if I can have a slide two, which is actually slide two and three, please. Okay, so... Leave it there. Uh, okay, so the idea that Jesus is a high priest has been mentioned before in the book of Hebrews. So I'll just have a look at uh, two passages from the book of Hebrews. Uh, first of which is uh, Hebrews chapter 2. So I'll read that out. Uh, verse 17. For this reason, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people, because he himself suffered when he was tempted. He is able to help those who are being tempted. So we see uh, this idea that, um, that Jesus is, is, is God, so there's a deity, okay? but also that Jesus is human as well. So that's a very, very important point. Okay, let's go to Hebrews 3, verse 1. Therefore, holy brothers and sisters, who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. So I looked at this in our Bible study recently. So Jesus, in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1, uh, gets described as an apostle and a high priest. And so Hebrews um, chapter 4, verse 14 onwards, develops this idea more extensively. So I'll just get you guys to look at, at your Bibles or, or smartphones, and if we can have a look at chapter 4, verses uh, 14 to 15. Uh, the writer to the Hebrews actually delves into and elaborates on this unique character of Jesus as our high priest, and also looks at the key differences between Jesus our high priest, and his predecessors. So let's examine this together. Verse 14. No other high priest was called great. And furthermore, no other high priest previously uh, passed through the heavens. Verse 14 also elaborates on the fact that Jesus, our high priest, is the Son of God. And no other high priest has been called the Son of God. Moreover, Jesus has passed through the heavens. He has ascended into heaven and now ministers there for our sake. And both of these truths really should, should press and compel and encourage us to hold firmly to our confession of faith. And verse 15 is pretty important. It further reveals that the high priest can sympathize with us. Jesus understands our, our weaknesses, our struggle with sin. Sin, as we know, is a hard issue. In essence, 
It's a rejection of God's plan for mankind. For you and I, the outward manifestations of sin are a multitude, aren't they? And we all know what we struggle with. Um, you know, I think in Western society, it can manifest as pride, materialism, greed, coveting, wanting what other people want, or really any other type of you know, idol worship, be it literal or metaphorical, anything that prohibits us from worshipping the one true God. So we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathise. We have a high priest that remembers his compassionate humanity. Hebrews 2, verses 5 to 18, looks at this idea. It means that Jesus, God the Son, enthroned in heaven, our high priest can sympathise with our weaknesses. And, and the translation of sympathise is to suffer along with. So we have a high priest who can suffer along with our weaknesses and our sinfulness. Well, as many of you, I work as a, uh, got a local GP, and one of my jobs, um, and one of the joys of my jobs is uh, just having this opportunity to be able to um, you know, get to know families uh, pretty well, and uh, in particular, there are lots of um, young families uh, that, that see me. Um, and it's nice to be able to you know, help them out you know, medically and, and just see you know, the kids grow and, uh, and see the parents uh, you know, enjoy the, the fruits of, of having children. Uh, but in my earlier days, when I, when I first started practicing independently, I, I found it quite difficult to comprehend uh, why, uh, why I see so many highly functioning couples and they were just reduced to an absolute mess uh, when, when babies are added you know, to their family unit. Uh, these newborns eventually progress to become infants and then toddlers, and then later on there might be an addition of an extra uh, baby you know, uh, to the family, extra sibling added to their family unit. Um, so often I'll see a young family that enters my, my room um, and mum is, is beside herself, um, that, that they're flustered, often you know, they may be late to the consultation, the prams have, have, have got vomit stains on it, mum's shirt is covered in puree, <laughs> uh, dad is bleary-eyed, uh, and to make matters worse, often there's a toddler that's in the room who's just running havoc as well, you know, going through all my drawers, throwing stuff around, <laughs> eat, eating all my jelly beans. <laughs> And I'm thinking, you know, in my arrogant self, without kids, this is when I was, you know, we, we, I didn't have any children, I was thinking, like, why, how come the parents can't control their kids? Why can't they, they get, their, get their act together? <laughs> and then God humbled me, right? I was compelled to come off my high horse, and I've, I've been since blessed with, uh, you know, three beautiful children. Um, my two older children are teenagers, and my, my youngest is, is 12. I can't believe, you know, Nathan, my youngest, is actually going to be a teenager next year, and that's, that's with its own, own challenges as well. Um, and I do remember the early days, and look, I don't want to sound like I was an amazing dad, because Ange is an amazing mum and wife, and she did most of the heavy lifting, but look, I, I do remember the early days of just that perpetual poor sleep, the fatigue, the chaos, you know, the life being out of control, uh, prior to having kids, you know, my life was in control, and then all of a sudden it's not in control. Um, and it just allowed me to, to understand, you know, what those families were, were going through, um, and as a result of having children, I became more proficient in being able to empathise uh, with the patients that I've just mentioned, truly, to a certain extent, understand their struggles. And in doing so, hopefully I'm able to care for them a lot more effectively, coupled with sympathy. Well, Jesus added humanity to his deity and lived among us. When you have been there to live and to be with mankind, it makes all the difference. Jesus knows what it's like to be tempted and to battle against sin, though he was never stained by sin. And in light of this, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, reassures, invites, and encourages us to approach the throne of God, the throne of grace, the throne of God with confidence. And friends, we can do this because we have a high priest who is both omnipotent and compassionate. All right, can I have the uh, third slide? Okay, that's, uh, actually, sorry, back one, sorry about that. Perfect, okay, all right. All right, Neil on the home stretch, um, point three now. So we've seen that Jesus is omnipotent, yet compassionate. Uh, let's delve into the character of Jesus more so. Uh, so we're gonna look at the idea of Jesus being a priest forever, and Jesus is called by God. 
All right, so come with me to Hebrews chapter 5, verse 1 to 4, for those of you who have Bibles in front of you. Uh, the principles of priesthood are governed by the law of Moses, as we've learned, and that is every high priest is selected from among men. Uh, and verse 1 states, and we, we know part of this already, that the high priest may offer gifts and sacrifices for sin. We concentrate mainly on the sacrifices for sin, but the high priest in verse 1 uh, also offers gifts as well. Uh, verses 2 to 3 reiterates the high priest's compassion, particularly compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray, since he himself is also subject to weakness, the high priest that is, and specifically the high priest was more than a meat-cutting person offering animals to sacrifice. He also had compassion on those who were ignorant and going astray. Moreover, the high priest is called by God. This is a new idea, you know, from these verses. In verse 4, the high priest is actually called by God. And this is where we see the contrast between the initial high, high priests and the initial high priests were actually from the line of Levi. Um, and Aaron was the first high priest. Contrasting to, to Jesus, who is also a high priest, uh, but Jesus actually isn't from the line of Levi. So ponder that. How does that work out? Uh, Hebrews is you know, very, very uh, firm um, in saying that Jesus is a high priest, but yet Jesus isn't from the line of Levi. So the true priesthood, as I mentioned, and the high priest came from a, sp a specific line of descent. Uh, as you guys may remember, with Old Testament history, Jacob is Abraham's grandson. Every priest came from Levi. Levi was one of Jacob's 12 sons. God set the tribe of Levi apart to serve him and to represent him to the whole, of, to the whole nation of Israel. Um, and this is seen in Exodus 13, Numbers 3 as well. So how does Jesus fit into all of this? Well, this is when verses 5 and 10 you know, come into the argument. All right, Melchizedek. Who knows anything about Melchizedek? <laughs> Gav's going like this. <laughs> right, right. Okay, so I used to call him Mel C, actually. Mel C. Um, so <laughs> Melchizedek mentioned in these verses, uh, from the, the chapter 5, verses 5 to 10, uh, Melchizedek is one of the most intriguing characters in the Bible. Uh, he's first introduced in the story of Abraham. He is a mysterious priest king, and not a lot is known about his lineage. Uh, in Hebrews 7, uh, we're going to learn more about Melchizedek, so I'm not going to take away in the thunder of whoever's preaching on Hebrews 7, uh, but I think there's enough here in this passage to, to make the point. Uh, we learn, just very briefly from Hebrews 7, that his name means king of righteousness, king of Salem, which also means king of peace. He rules in a city that is later called Jerusalem. And in his interaction with Abraham in, in uh, Genesis chapter 14, uh, Melchizedek actually gives God blessing to Abraham after Abraham defeats an enemy. So what Melchizedek is doing is actually creates an expectation for the readers down the track that the human roles of priest and king in his order, in the order of Melchizedek, are meant to be joined together. And someone from Abraham's line should step into the priest-king office, now, now joined together. Um, so as, as you all may know, leading to this point in time, uh, the priests had their roles, okay? So the descendants of Levi, very specifically, had their role as priests to look after the temple, to, to offer sacrifices, and so on and so forth. And the king of Israel had a separate role. And you guys may recall when King Saul actually blurred those lines, um, and there was you know, punishment as a result of that. So this is a real game changer. So what the writer of Hebrews is saying is that the king and the priest can actually be one. Okay? The king and the priest can actually be one. The order of Melchizedek. All right, can I have uh, the Hebrews 5 slide, please? Okay. So let's go back to Hebrews chapter 5, verses 7 to 10. I'm just going to read that out to remind us. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God 
to be a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Okay, let's look at verse 9 specifically. Jesus fully assumed his role as our great high priest, having been made perfect. He became the source of salvation for all who obey him. Okay, one last contrast between the old covenant and the new covenant. Okay. We've established so far that Jesus' priesthood is associated with permanence pertaining to the forgiveness of sin. We also learn that Jesus' priesthood, like Melchizedek's, is unending. So there's permanence and also his priesthood is unending. And now let's contrast that to the shadow, the shadow being the old system, the Day of Atonement. So compared to Aaron's finite priesthood, there's no high priest from Aaron whereby there's a priesthood for eternity. So that's a key difference, isn't it? Um, And as I mentioned, Hebrews 7 will fully develop and elaborate on this theme more so. Okay, now I just want to take a few steps back now. And let's go back to verses uh, 7 to 8. So chapter 5, verses 7 to 8. And these verses have a a very striking resemblance uh, to the agony that Jesus suffered in the Garden of Gethsemane. The agony is palpable. Jesus, our high priest, struggled with the difficulty of obedience. Yet, he obeyed perfectly. Jesus asked that the cup of wrath to be taken away from him. This is uh, from Luke chapter 22, verse 42. Yet the cup was not taken away. Though Jesus was God the Son, he submitted to his Father to do the will of his Father. And by doing the will of his Father, we learn from Luke chapter 24, verses 45 to 48, the culmination of God's salvation plan, which started as a shadow, i.e. the Old Testament sacrificial system, the Day of Atonement, now obsolete, superseded by the reality of Jesus being our high priest. Okay, let me say that again. This is a take-home message. By doing the will of his Father, we learn from Luke chapter 24, verses 45 to 48, the culmination of God's salvation plan, which started off as a shadow, i.e. the Old Testament sacrificial system, encompassing the Day of Atonement, now obsolete, superseded by the reality of Jesus being our high priest. And I'll just have a slide five. Okay. Um, Do you want to just click on that again? Okay, so it's only got the one verse there. Okay. All right, look. um, I'm just going to end by reading from uh, Luke 24. uh, And this is taken from verses uh, 45 to 48. And this is a a post-resurrection passage, okay? Let me read. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and, and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Okay, let's have the concluding slide. All right, so it's been a bit of a whirlwind today, and hopefully if we go back to the outline, let's keep it nice and simple. Okay, we've learned about the Day of Atonement, a shadow of the reality to come. We'll learn about Jesus as our high priest and the various characteristics of Jesus as our high priest. And look, I guess the point four is a challenge you know, for, for all of us. Now, you know, is Jesus your high priest? Uh, so for many of us who have been Christians for a long time, um, you know, Jesus is our high priest and we should do everything possible collectively you know, as, as Christians attending St. Mark's and you know, collected with other Christian friends outside of this church to ensure that Jesus remains our high priest. And for those who, who don't have Jesus as your high priest yet, um, as we've learned a lot of detail about you know, what it all, all entails, um, what, what are some of your barriers? What are some of the things uh, stopping you from accepting Jesus as your high priest? And certainly, if you have any, any qualms or, or concerns, you know, I'd love to talk to you about you know, any, any um, worries or anxieties that you might have of accepting Jesus as, as your high priest. And so with the staff here, so, so Gav, Jason, and Tim, um, you know, we'd love to, to answer your questions. All right, let me close by reading 
from Hebrews chapter 5, verses um, 8 to 10. Specifically verse 9, concentrating verse 9. Son, though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Let me close in prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for your word. Uh, We thank you, Lord, that your word is useful for, for teaching us how to best relate to you. We thank you, Lord, that you've reminded us today that you've provided a high priest, that, Lord, the Old Testament sacrificial system was set up for us to understand your salvation plan and understand that it's only through Jesus that allows restoration of that broken relationship that we have with you. And we do thank you, Lord, that if we do trust in Jesus, our sins are forgiven. We'll have salvation, Lord. And that, Lord, you haven't left us alone in these last days. You've given us your spirit to press compel, to illuminate us, so we know how to live a life that is pleasing to you. We pray, Lord, that we'll continue to meditate and have a think about the significance of Jesus as a high priest. For those of us who have been Christians for a while and have trusted the high priest, uh, we know that the book of Hebrews, the main premise behind it is to continue to run the race. Don't fall back to old habits. Don't fall back to any other distractions, any other idols that would turn you away from Jesus, our high priest. And for those of us who are contemplating, we do pray, Lord, that uh, this passage would continue to resonate, continue to challenge and continue to allow you to think about um, the true meaning of life when it comes to salvation matters. And we do pray all these things in your precious son's name. Amen.